Adolf Hitler, now the Führer of Germany, has promised to bring prosperity and happiness back to the German people. He's also about to unleash hell on the world. Years of bloody warfare that includes a plan to annihilate the Jews and other people he considers a plague on mankind. But our first day starts with some deception and comes before the outbreak of World War II. It involves the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, going over to Germany and having a chat with Hitler in his apartment. By this time, Hitler has already annexed Austria and it's looking like he might have Czechoslovakia in his sights. The Brits and many other countries are wondering what this strange man with the funny mustache might do next. At the meeting, Hitler and Chamberlain signed the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, which states that the two countries will not go to war. Chamberlain then writes to his sister, In spite of the hardness and ruthlessness I thought I saw in his face, I got the impression that there was a man who could be relied upon when he had given his word. Chamberlain arrives in England a hero. He's seen standing on a balcony at Buckingham Palace with the King and Queen. He gets a standing ovation when he speaks at the House of Commons. To tens of thousands of people, he announces that there will be peace for our time. Still, there are some people in the crowd that have read Hitler's book Mein Kampf, My Struggle in English. They know about his thoughts on what he perceives to be a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. They understand that he has big plans for Germany. They've read things like this. All great cultures of the past perished only because the originally creative race died out from blood poisoning. Chamberlain, however, tells those closest to him that Mr. Hitler is not insane. He says he's an excitable kind of chap, but in reality he would barely stand out in a crowd. Hitler, he says, is not hell-bent on starting a major war. Day 1, September 1, 1939, just over one year later. At 2 a.m., the German Army's 1st Mounted Regiment hears the call of a bugle on the Polish border. Someone shouts, muzzle caps off, load! There are around 1.5 million German soldiers and 1.2 million Polish soldiers currently fighting on the Western Front. The Germans seep into Poland like an infestation. Within a short time, the horses of the Polish are crashing to the ground. An hour later, the Germans march on as riderless horses run through clouds of smoke. In town, civilians hear the sounds of planes dropping bombs from the sky. Sirens fill the air. Kids and their parents are running through the streets, still dressed in their pajamas. The German Luftwaffe shows no mercy, raining bullets down on unarmed people. The head of the British military mission in Poland, General Adrian Carlton, writes a letter. I'm seeing the very face of war change. It's glory shorn, no longer the soldiers setting forth into battle, but the women and children being buried under it. This is a war of machines. A new kind of war has begun. Day 3 Men in flat caps shout from newspaper stands all over Britain. Read all about it! Hitler invades Poland! On the front page of the Evening Standard, a headline in bold reads, I will give Poland a lesson, Hitler. Both Britain and France declare war on Germany. Americans on the other side of the world listen to their radios and think, thank God that's not us. There's no way they're going to fight another European war. Day 4 Nazi Party official Fritz Mühlebach writes in a letter, I regard Britain and France's interference as nothing but a formality. As soon as they realize the utter hopelessness of Polish resistance and the vast superiority of German arms, they will begin to see that we are always in the right and it's pointless to meddle. The British and French are hoping that by saying they're joining the war, they'll call Hitler's bluff. In any way, they're still thinking that the people of Germany will overthrow this mad dictator. Day 8 The residents of Warsaw listen to their radios as bombs fall. Chopin's military polonaise plays through the din of thousands of machine guns. 30,000 bombs will drop every day, and the German army will storm the city, eventually killing 18,000 civilians in Warsaw, and in just one day, taking 140,000 civilians as prisoners of war. Hitler has plans for them at his concentration camps, places, as you'll see, where the peak of human depravity will be on show. Day 17 The Polish are thinking that the French will be joining them today in the fight. It doesn't happen. What happens instead is Joseph Stalin's army crosses over the Polish border in a vicious attack of its own against the Eastern European nation. Stalin is intending to get some of the spoils of war, and for now at least, he has a pact with Hitler. Day 36 Hitler is in Warsaw, proudly walking through the ruins of a devastated city. Foreign correspondents line up to hear him speak. Hitler tells them, gentlemen, you see for yourselves what criminal folly it is to try and defend this city. He sends the world a stark warning saying, I only wish certain statesmen in other countries, who seem to want to turn all Europe into a second Warsaw, could have the opportunity to see, as you have, the real meaning of war. Hitler's message is clear. Get in our way and your cities will be turned to rubble. Do not test me. The German army is a beast and other countries know it. The US ambassador in London, Joseph Kennedy, asks, where on earth can the Allies fight the Germans and beat them? No one wants to hear such words, but he has a point. Day 104 
Hitler is angry, stamping his feet on the ground, spit coming out of his mouth as he screams at his generals. He's embarrassed more than anything. He's had his first taste of defeat at the Battle of the River Plot when his navy, Kriegsmarine, experienced a humiliating defeat against the superior British navy. Maybe the Germans aren't invincible after all. Day 252 Hitler has already had success in invading both Denmark and Norway. On this day, his troops invade Belgium, with Hitler feeling supremely confident that its blitzkrieg tactics will make easy work of the country. Over in the UK, a new man has become prime minister, a stubborn old goat with a taste for war and a romantic idea of empire. His name is Winston Churchill. Soon he will make one of his moving speeches on the radio, telling the Brits, arm yourselves and be ye men of valor and be in readiness for conflict. The problem is, in spite of Churchill's powerful words, the Germans have a much stronger military and Hitler knows this only too well. Day 270 The Nazis now occupy Belgium. Hitler's troops again show no mercy as they shoot down unarmed Belgian civilians. One and a half million manage to flee the country, but many thousands are slaughtered. Houses are on fire as tanks destroy everything in sight. Day 279 A big day, Hitler delivers a message to his troops. Soldiers of the Western Front, Dunkirk has fallen. Soldiers, my confidence in you knows no bounds. You have not disappointed me. 40,000 French and English troops are all that remains of the formerly great armies. Immeasurable quantities of material have been captured. The greatest battle in the history of the world has come to an end. He's now winning the Battle of France. He sent the British scurrying off back to England where, to be honest, they count their blessings. The evacuation was perilous, but it could have been much worse. The German military is a force of nature. Day 299 Hitler is celebrating again. Bodies of French citizens lay strewn across the countryside, their faces no longer recognizable. With 4.2 million German army soldiers, 1 million Luftwaffe, 180,000 Kriegsmarine, and 100,000 Waffen-SS, the Nazi party military, Hitler has taken France. The result is occupation and collaboration under Vichy France. 85,310 French military personnel have died defending France, and the British have also been considerably weakened losing not just thousands of men, but hundreds of ships and close to a thousand aircraft. Let's just remember that Hitler has always had a soft spot for Britain. He once said the English nation will have to be considered the most valuable ally in the world. He believes that the only reason he's hated in the UK is because of an American and Jewish conspiracy. Still, now he knows he has to defeat this tiny nation. Day 314 Hitler is sitting in a quiet room at home, mulling over a speech that Churchill made a while back. Part of it went like this. We shall fight in France, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender." Hitler now reflects on this, smiling wide. He looks down at his pet Alstation and says, They did fight us in France, didn't they? But they lost, didn't they, my little German dumpling? Churchill knows what's coming. He outlined this in another speech. Hitler knows he'll have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. Most of the world doesn't give Britain a chance. Even if Hitler has to hold back on a land invasion, his airstrikes will get Britain down on its knees, begging to sign a peace treaty. Then he can take off conquering elsewhere, notably Stalin's Russia. Packed, schmacked. Day 339 Into the Battle of Britain, the RAF is a handful, that's for sure. German intelligence has supplied information that is incorrect, thinking the British are much weaker than they actually are. The British, on the other hand, think the Germans are much stronger than they are. Hundreds of German bombers fly over cities in England and many civilians are killed, but the British are resilient. Germany makes a strategic error, one of many during the Battle of Britain. They focus on bombing not airfields but concentrating on cities. This brings great relief to Churchill, who secretly thanks Hitler. The cities can take it, he thinks. He's right. Day 427 Brits are out in the streets celebrating. People all over the country laugh while singing this song. Hitler has only got one ball. Goring has two, but very small. Himmler is rather similar, but poor old Goebbels has no balls at all. Germany has made too many strategic mistakes, but what the Brits don't know is that Hitler's focus isn't on Britain now. He can save that for later. Now he wants to invade the Soviet Union. He has economic reasons for this, but ideological ones too. He might have a love-hate relationship with Britain, but for the Soviet Union he only feels hate. He despises communists and anyway, the Soviet Union, he says, is full of Jews and Slavs. Germany and Britain have lost over 3,000 aircraft between them and over 4,000 personnel, not to mention the 43,000 British civilians that have perished under the German bombs in an eight-month battle. 
But as no one expects Britain to hold its own, the people of the world have now gained confidence. Over in the US, where many folks expected Britain to fall, people are saying the Battle of Britain will go down in history as a battle as important as Waterloo or Gettysburg. A battle might have been won, but the fight is just beginning. Day 661 it's 3.15 in Berlin and Hitler is inside his apartment at the Reich Chancellery on Wilhelmstrasse 77. Down at his side is the Alsatian puppy he's just been given, Blondie. He strokes the back of Blondie's head and says, They won't know what's hit them, will they, my little dumpling? 3.8 million men, thousands and thousands of aircraft, tanks, artillery are coming to squash those Slavic fools. He pats the dog on the head, saying, Stalin's not so tough, is he, dumpling? Let's see if he really is the Man of Steel. Stalin might not be so tough, but his people are. Millions of them will be slaughtered in the bloodiest fight the world has ever seen. They will starve, freeze, and over 300,000 will be killed by their own army for defecting or other such transgressions. Around 5 million Soviets will be taken prisoner, and many of them will be tortured and killed. But these are people as hard as the cold Russian soil in winter. They will prevail. Hitler doesn't know that when he's detailing to Blondie what he'll do to them, that night he lies awake mulling over every other detail of the invasion. Operation Barbarossa is about to start. Just after 3.15, close to the Bug River Bridge on the Russian-Germany border, a German soldier shouts over to the Russian side, Hey guys, can you come over here for a second? We have some important matters to discuss. As soon as the Russians walk over, all of them are machine gunned down. In the mayhem, German sappers pull the charges to blow up the bridge. The German soldiers think it's kill or be enslaved by an inferior race of devils. What Hitler doesn't account for is just how resilient these people are. Six million of them were not long ago killed under Stalin's oppressive measures when he began a system of forced industrialization. They know what pain is. Hitler's hoping some of them won't want to fight or they might defect, and this is one reason why he thinks he'll be victorious. Stalin will dispatch millions of troops, young and old if need be and they will walk into gunfire because if they don't, their own commanders will have them killed. Day 829 Japanese planes rain bombs down on the US Air Base at Pearl Harbor. The US is caught unprepared. It's a total disaster, and one which Japan sees as a resounding success. That'll show the Americans what happens when you offer support to the Allies, and it should make them think twice about interfering with Japan's plans for Southeast Asia. Hitler finds out about the attack only after it happens, since Japan hasn't given him any warning. He's delighted, telling one of his commanders, We can't lose the war at all. We now have an ally which has never been conquered in 3,000 years. Still, he's never relinquished his objective that one day in the future he'll have to defeat what he calls the Yellow Race. He's quite content, thinking that Britain will now have his hands full of fighting Japan in its empire in the east, and the US will stay out of its way, since it'll have to deal with Japan. Hitler can now concentrate on Eastern European domination. Day 833 the US declares war on Germany and Italy after already declaring war on Japan. President Roosevelt matches Churchill with his rousing words, saying, The forces endeavoring to enslave the entire world now are moving toward this hemisphere. Rapid and united effort by all the peoples of the world who are determined to remain free will ensure a world victory of the forces of justice and a righteousness over the forces of savagery and barbarism. Hitler believes the US, a race of mongrels, can't fight to save their lives. He has little respect for this relatively new nation, but he'll see what these mongrels are capable of soon. Day 1010 If you need to know about the USA's strength, look no further than the victory against Japan in the Battle of Midway. It just happened on this day. Japan takes an absolute beating, but not quite a knockout punch. 3,057 Japanese have died compared to the USA's 307. Day 1100 A German soldier named Hans-Jürgen Hartmann says never mind how many Russians they slaughter, they just keep coming. He and his men are starving too and dying from the bitter cold. They've been ordered to kill everyone in sight. In his diary he writes, how brutal this war is becoming. It's now a total war, a war against women, children, and old people, and that is the greatest horror. But he, like the other troops, has had words like this drilled into his head time and again. Russia, a country of cruelty, must be cruelly treated. At some point soon Hitler will realize he can't outright win this war and he'll carry on fighting in order to get what he thinks Germany deserves as part of settlements. Day 1206 The battles of Stalingrad and Leningrad have been raging for a while now, and they're both horrific affairs. Together, millions of people will die, mostly Soviets, but Germany will also see a shocking number of casualties. War is always monstrous, but these battles are something the word monstrous cannot begin to describe. Both sides have acted with savagery on an unprecedented scale. But Stalin has taken advantage of this by getting his people into a state of fury in what he's called the Patriotic War. 
But as time passes, some German soldiers don't hold out much hope for a victory. As can be seen in the words of a panzer officer named Wolfgang Paul, he writes, We have blundered mistakenly into an alien landscape with which we can never be properly acquainted. Everything is cold, hostile, and working against us. Another German soldier says the Russians will fight to the very last man and die over every last foot of land. He says we're entering a war of attrition and I only hope in the long run that Germany will win it. Day 1250 In Leningrad, the people are being starved, with bread rations being only 4.5 ounces per day. The people try to carry on. A scientist named Axel Reichardt actually finishes a great work called The Fauna of the Soviet Union. Days later, he's found slumped over in a chair, dead. The theater still puts on plays, but half starved, the actors collapse on stage. A woman named Elena writes in her diary, People are so weak with hunger that they're completely indifferent to death. They perish as if they're falling asleep. Those half-dead people who are still around do not even pay attention to them. Perhaps the most shocking thing is cannibalism among the starved. In the winter of 1942, a report at the militia office in Leningrad contains these chilling words. One woman, utterly worn out and desperate, said that when her husband fainted through exhaustion and lack of food, she hacked off a part of his leg to feed herself and her children. That woman was executed. The British and the Americans don't know the full scale of the misery. They're just hoping the Russians can hold out, not concerned about how they do it. Lieutenant von Heil writes back to his family in Germany, Human life is cheap, cheaper than the shovels we use to clear the roads of snow. The state we've reached will seem quite unbelievable to you back home. We do not kill humans but the enemy, who are rendered impersonal animals at best. They behave the same toward us. These battles on the Eastern Front will go on for years and easily be the biggest bloodbath of World War II. But Russia will hold out. Day 1400 Hitler is reading documents about what's happening in the Nazi death camps. Around 6 million Jews will die at the hands of the Nazis, while prisoners of other ethnicities will be murdered, starved, or beaten to death, or used for medical experiments in the camps. The human depravity at these camps is incalculable. Things are changing on the battlefields, though, and Hitler is now rarely the receiver of good news. Day 1532 Hitler finds himself backed into a corner. The Italians have just retreated and he knows that the Soviets are about to stage a big offensive. He thinks if he can just push back the Anglo-American invasion of France, he might be able to move more troops back to Russia. Many of Hitler's top generals don't agree with his orders, with one of them, Rolf Helmut Schroeder, saying if he just lets them decide what to do, they might stand a chance at having some success. Still, Hitler's word is final. He's deluded, thinking his posters on the walls in Ukraine, saying Hitler the Liberator will become a reality. He's wrong. Day 1542 Hitler writes an important letter to his generals. He says no more troops should be sent to the Eastern Front. He says the Anglo-American armies must be fought in Italy and France, where they soon will be. At this point, the long battle of Leningrad is pretty much lost, but the Germans keep fighting. There's much debate among the US and the UK as to how to take France back, with Churchill disagreeing with the Americans about bombing the French railways. He says that will mean too many civilian casualties, to which the Americans say such collateral damage will have to happen if they are to be victorious. 70,000 French folks will be killed by those Allied bombers, since many French embraced the Vichy regime and fought against the Allies. Some generals aren't too bothered about spilling some French blood. Day 1574 Allies stormed the beaches of Hitler's so-called Atlantic Wall in Normandy in France. What we know as D-Day, the D just stands for day. As many will later say, it's like walking into the jaws of death. 156,000 Allied troops, mostly American, British, and Canadian, arrive on the beaches, some embracing battle and others scared out of their wits. A US private will later write, There were men crying with fear, men defecating themselves. I lay there with some others, too petrified to move. He was hit in the arm and thought it was a bullet, only to find out it was someone's hand that had been shot off. In the US, everyone's listening to the news on the radio, while in the UK, even the industrial strikes have been cancelled for the day, so people can listen to live reports and go and donate blood. One of the German soldiers writes a letter that morning. The whistling of shells and shattering explosions around us created the worst kind of music. Only a tiny, tiny handful of our company remains. By evening, the British have beaten back the German 21st Panzer Division, and the Americans have established positions up to three miles inland. 2,501 men die from the USA, 1,449 British, 391 Canadian, and 73 from other Allied countries also die in the invasion, as well as thousands more Germans and, as you know, even more French civilians. Day 1600 Hitler is on the brink of defeat. His troops are now withdrawing from all over the Western Front Line and facing utter catastrophe in Russia. In Germany, many towns and cities have been devastated by Allied bombs and the morale of the people is low. Hitler should surrender, but he will not. He might lose, but he's going to cause as much bloodshed as possible, even if that means conscripting children. Day 1784 
It is madness to carry on and this is why some Nazi generals on this day try to kill Hitler with a bomb. They fail, Hitler is injured, and while his trousers certainly take some damage, he will be shouting orders again soon. Now in a state of paranoia and shock, Hitler orders an investigation and many, many people who he even minutely believes are against him are arrested. 4,980 of them are executed. One of them screams out before the executioners pull the trigger. The whole world will vilify us now, but I am still totally convinced that we did the right thing. Hitler is the archenemy not only of Germany but of the world. Day 2029 the Allies have entered Germany, with the Soviet Red Army getting there first in the east. They will give no quarter to German civilians. Their troops have seen such horrors over the years. A woman who is now starving writes, We are afraid. From the west, the British and the Americans will invade, and like the Soviets will march toward Berlin. The Soviet soldier writes in his diary, At first the fascists fought back fiercely, but they could not endure this hell. Everything is bound to finish soon. He's right, kind of. As this is happening, the Germans are busy exterminating people in their concentration camps trying to burn all the documents that show what horrors they committed. Many of the Nazi bigwigs and scientists who work in those camps are already making their getaways, and to everyone's astonishment, in the decades to come, some will be helped by American intelligence agencies if they prove useful to science or in the new fight against communist Russia. Day 2042 The Americans liberate the Ordruf concentration camp in Germany and cannot believe what they're seeing. They see stacks of dead bodies, people alive that have suffered cruelty on an unimaginable scale, and soon, when the other camps are liberated, the Allies will begin to understand the absolute evil of Nazi ideology. The Soviets have already seen similar horrors. When they liberated the largest camp at Auschwitz, they found stacks of shoes and bodies thrown into trenches. It's around this time that from his bunker in Berlin, Hitler learns that some of his orders haven't been followed. He suffers a nervous breakdown. Day 2044 Stalin wants to get to Berlin first. This isn't only a matter of pride, but also because he's aware that the US and Britain have almost perfected a nuclear bomb. When he gets to Berlin, he's going to make sure he gets his hands on German scientists. Day 2063 The Red Army's General Zukov and General Konev have their troops stationed around Berlin. They meet with resistance, but many of the German fighters are boys that are so young their helmets drop over their baby faces. When they're shot and injured, they give off high-pitched screams. One reason the Germans are fighting so stubbornly is that they know what will happen to them if the Red Army catches them. It will be death, but it might not be a fast one, especially for the women civilians. Day 2066 From his bunker, Hitler can hear gunfire and bombs. He wakes up, as usual, to the sound of his valet, Heinz Linga, shouting, On your marks! Hitler learns that Mussolini has been shot and his body paraded around, spat at and beaten, and hung up with meat hooks, something Hitler imagines will happen to him at the hands of the enemy. He returns to Linga and says, You must never allow my corpse to fall into the hands of the Russians. They would make a spectacle in Moscow out of my body and put it in waxworks. Linga agrees and then hands Hitler some flatulence pills, one of 28 medications he's on, and also some cocaine drops for an eye problem. To make matters even worse, the Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler has just tried to negotiate a surrender with the enemy. It's the end and Himmler knows it. Hitler knows it too. On this day, he gets married to his mistress Eva Braun. They celebrate with copious cups of champagne, but this will be a very short marriage. Day 2068 Hitler wakes up at about 11 am and calls for his secretary, Trottel Junga. They have tea together and Hitler asks, Have you had a nice little rest, child? She replies, Yes, I've slept a little. Hitler says, Come along, I want to dictate something. In his last will and testament, he says that Germany isn't to blame for all the years of misery and carnage, saying it was desired and provoked entirely by those international statesmen who were either of Jewish origin or worked in the Jewish interest. He adds, the responsibility of the outbreak of this war cannot rest on me, and instead he blames British politicians and the Jewish hierarchy. Four people signed the document, Goebbels, Bormann, Bergdorf, and Krebs, and soon, like Hitler, they're all dead. Before they die, Goebbels and Bormann take Hitler's body along with his wife's body and burn them in the garden of the Reich Chancellery. As they do this, Soviet guns can be heard close by. Soon, the Americans and British arrive in Berlin, but it is the French army who believe they're owed something by the Germans that do most of the looting and killing. Sometimes they arrive at houses only to find whole families sitting in chairs in the living room, all of them dead already. This is why a British officer named David Fraser writes, There is so much vile cruelty in the world for us to say that with any satisfaction that good has been victorious. At home in England, the philosopher and pacifist Bertrand Russell puts pen to paper. He agreed that Hitler had to be stopped, but he still writes, And all this madness, all this rage, all this flaming death of our civilization and our hopes has been brought about because a set of official gentlemen living luxurious lives, mostly stupid, and all without imagination or heart, 
have chosen that it should occur rather than that any one of them should suffer some infinitesimally small rebuff to his country's pride. Now you need to hear this amazing story why Hitler's nephew was his worst enemy or have a look at this.